The structural changes that accompany organic reactions are relatively complex. Generally, a large number of electrons move around. And if we're being intellectually honest with ourselves, that complexity is difficult to get a handle on when you're first starting out. One tool that's extremely helpful to help you take stock of what's going on in terms of electronic movements within a reaction is this idea of identifying bonds made in a reaction, that is, bonds created in the products, and bonds broken in a reaction, that is, bonds destroyed in the reactants. In this hypothetical general example, for instance, we can see that the linkages connecting A and B and C and D are both broken in the course of this reaction since A and B are no longer linked to each other and C and D are no longer linked to each other. At the same time, the reaction has established some new bonds between A and D and B and C. We'll see in this video that identifying bonds made and broken gives us great insight into the reaction type, the class of reaction that's occurring, but it can also give us mechanistic insights since patterns in bonds made and broken and the types of atoms linked in bonds made and broken give us insight into where the electrons came from, for example, in bonds that are made, or where the electrons went in a bond that was broken. The same types of atoms occur over and over again in organic structures, right? Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen being the four most common. And so to distinguish between different types of bonds, what we really need to do is map atoms, or assign numbers to atoms in starting materials, and then draw those numbers on the corresponding atoms in the products. This helps us track the atoms visually throughout the reaction. You really only need to map atoms where chemical change is occurring, although it can often help to map atoms in the vicinity of where changes are occurring as well. For example, in this reaction, we could start with the aldehyde and just map three key atoms here, one, two, and three, and move to the other reaction partner and map its key atoms for five, six and let's say seven just to map that last oxygen and here we want to assign different numbers to every atom in the starting material so that we can find them in the products. In the products atoms one and three look very similar to their counterparts in the starting materials and atom two has undergone some change. By following what hasn't changed in the other reaction partner we can see that oxygen seven is actually buried in the CO2 CH3 fragment which has an expanded structure that looks like this, with oxygen 7 here and carbon 6 here or here, meaning that carbon 4 must be the one that formed a bond to carbon 2, and carbon 5 comes between 4 and 6, just as it did in the starting material. Now, let's generate lists of bonds made in the products, bonds that exist in the products that did not exist in the starting materials, and I'm going to highlight those in black, as well as bonds broken in the starting materials, bonds that existed in the starting materials that no longer exist in the products. And I'm going to highlight these in red. Drawing in implicit hydrogens here is extremely important because very often hydrogens can go unnoticed even when, for example, CH bonds are broken. And that's what's going on here. There's a bond between carbon-2 and a hydrogen that's not shown explicitly, but very clearly, since carbon-2 contains a new bond to another carbon in the product, this bond breaks. So let's go ahead and map that hydrogen atom, noticing that it appears not to have a counterpart in the products just yet, but we'll get there. Hold that thought. Let's note that though as our first bond broken, the carbon two hydrogen eight bond. Bonds broken may be single, double, or triple bonds. And one thing we should notice about carbons four and five is that they go from being linked by a double bond to being linked by a single bond only. This implies that the pi bond linking carbons 4 and 5 is broken in the course of this reaction. And to show that, we could either just write C4, C5 with a double bond linkage like this, or circle or highlight as the case may be, just one of the two bonds to show that only one of the two is actually broken. Now let's move to the bonds made. It's evident here that a new bond is made between carbon 2 and carbon 4 that doesn't exist in the starting materials. This bond replaces or substitutes for the carbon 2 H bond in the starting materials, indicating a kind of substitution process occurring in the vicinity of this carbonyl carbon in the starting materials. There's another bond that's made in the products that doesn't exist in the starting materials. Can you see it? Well, let's draw out the implicit hydrogens around carbon 5. Carbon 5 bears one hydrogen in the starting material, but in the products, carbon 5 is a fully saturated carbon, meaning that it bears two hydrogens. 
carbon-5 has gone from bearing one hydrogen to bearing two hydrogens, meaning that one of these CH bonds must be a newly made bond in the products. In fact, this is where our mysterious hidden hydrogen-8 was hiding the entire time, buried as one of the implied hydrogens on carbon-5. Recognizing that the C5H8 bond was made is thus key. It allows us to ensure that the reaction is balanced, and it shows us the fate of all of the important atoms in the starting materials in the transformation of products. One other thing to mention before moving past this example is what's going on with the catalyst. Well, a catalyst is a species that engages in a reaction mechanism, but is not chemically transformed. And the way to think about that, I think, in terms of mechanistic reasoning that works best, is to imagine, in this case, a C and minus molecule, and a plus is, as we've seen, just an innocent spectator here, on the reactant side, and a C and minus molecule on the product side. So the catalyst doesn't engage in any bonds made or broken net overall in the reaction. But the tricky thing about the catalyst is it does undergo chemical change within the reaction mechanism. It does engage in the reaction mechanism. You can imagine if it didn't, it'd have no way to influence the reaction rate. It's through engaging with the substrates that the catalyst actually accomplishes its mission of accelerating the reaction rate. It's just that it's transformed back to its original structure at the end of the reaction mechanism. For this reason, catalysts can be mechanistically tricky because they will get involved in the reaction mechanism, but it's not entirely clear in terms of a bonds made and broken sense how they'll get involved, since they won't ever appear in these lists of bonds made and broken overall. Once you've generated this list, the way to use it is to think deeply about how bonds are made and broken. In other words, for every bond that's made, where did the electrons come from? Where did the electrons come from in the C2? C4 bond, carbon 2 or carbon 4? What about the carbon 5, hydrogen 8 bond? Where are electrons more likely to come from in that case? Is it more likely that H- donated electrons to a positively charged carbon 5 or that a negatively charged carbon 5 donated electrons to an acidic or positively charged H8? Questions like this will help you unearth the mechanism and generate reasonable possibilities for elementary steps that might occur. And as long-winded as generating a list of bonds made and broken may seem, and the prerequisite step of mapping atoms may seem, as you do this more and more, you will begin to notice patterns in the types of bonds made and broken. In this last example, for instance, we can notice from the way the reactants combined and the fact that there are no byproducts, and that new bonds were made between all of the atoms of the aldehyde and all of the atoms of this unsaturated ester, that this is an addition reaction. Listing the bonds made and broken and recognizing that there are no byproducts help us see this. Just to drive this point home, we can look at bonds made and broken in the typical reaction classes that we've already seen. In a substitution reaction, one bond substitutes for another. The departing bond, the bond that's substituted for, quote unquote, breaks, here it's the carbon bromine bond in this particular example, and at one of the atoms involved in that original bond that breaks, we see a new bond that has substituted for the bond that broke. This is true of every substitution process. One bond substitutes for another, so one bond is made at an atom, and one bond is broken at that atom. Addition reactions involve the incorporation of the atoms of one molecule into another. And this typically involves a cycling of the bonds, as we saw in the last example, meaning there are two bonds broken in the starting materials. Here the HCl hypothetical bond is broken, and the pi bond is broken, and two new bonds are formed so that the substrate and reagent become fully linked. Here there's a new bond between carbon and chlorine that's formed, and a new carbon-hydrogen bond that's formed that I haven't drawn out explicitly. Elimination reactions are just the opposite of additions and involve a kind of cycling that breaks a molecule apart. The eliminations we'll focus on are base-promoted, so that there's a new H-base bond that's formed, and in terms of bonds made and broken, we find the opposite pattern of addition, where two single bonds in the starting material are generally broken to produce fragmented products, here OTS- and this H base conjugate acid molecule. And the other new bond that's formed is a new pi bond. And notice that this is the opposite of addition, where a pi bond was broken. In elimination, a pi bond is made. Rearrangement reactions involve just the reorganization of atoms within a molecule, and here, 
The key idea is that no bond can break without also reforming somewhere else in the molecule. And so while the electron flow may not be fully internal, especially in cases where a catalyst is present, the pattern of bonds made and broken looks that way since, of course, no electrons could be added to or removed from this molecule. They just reorganized themselves and took some atoms for the ride along with them. In this particular case, for example, we notice a new carbon-oxygen pi bond made and a carbon-oxygen pi bond in the starting material broken. We also notice an oxygen-hydrogen bond broken in this starting material. But, surprise, a hydrogen-oxygen bond was also made in the product. Finally, there's an implied hydrogen here and an implied hydrogen here, showing us that a CH bond was broken in this starting material, but a CH bond was also formed in the product. So for every bond breaking event in the starting material, there's a bond making event that's corresponding in the product. That's a hallmark of rearrangement reactions.